it's Brian. In this episode of Heart to Heart, I talk to seasoned television director Norman Buckley. His journey in the industry began as an editor and eventually led him to directing acclaimed shows like The O.C., Chuck, and Gossip Girl. With over 130 hours of television under his belt, he knows both what it takes for an actor to get hired and how they can be sure to stand out once they are on set. Norman is not only one of the most knowledgeable people in the industry, he is one of the nicest. And he shares a variety of powerful insights throughout our conversation. Before you listen, you've got to grab our backstage pass. It's packed with Norman's top tips, insider advice, and additional resources that will give you a competitive edge. You can grab the backstage pass by going to podcastbackstagepass.com. Everyone, today I'm joined by a very special guest, Norman Buckley, who is uh, just one of the most like genuine and nicest people in the industry that I know. Um, actually. I wouldn't say a few years ago, but I feel like this is like almost many years ago now. I actually auditioned for Norman uh, for Rizzoli and Isle, and and um, that's that, that's where we first met. And then I was lucky enough to get the job and uh, you know get to uh, work with him on set. And then um, ever since then, we've had him you know teach at uh, Next Level, and um, he's just uh, such a you know acclaimed TV director in the industry. Oh, gosh. You know, time goes so quickly these days. It really uh, has been several years now. Um, I look back on certain things that I feel like happened yesterday, and then I check, and they were 10 or 12 years ago. So <laughs> right, right. that's the way it is, I guess. So um, I just wanted to kind of talk about how you first got started, because, you know, I know that uh, you first started as an editor. Is, is that correct? You wanted to uh, get into writing originally, but then you found that you had an aptitude for editing, and, and that's kind of how you got started in the biz? I graduated from USC's film school in 1980, and uh, I didn't really know what I was going to do, how I was going to break into the industry. So I just came back here to Texas and was working in industrial films. And my sister was in a movie, Tender Mercies, which was shot near here. And I, um, uh, fortunately, she heard that the editor was looking for an assistant. And so she told him that I just graduated from film school. And I went over and met with him. And he said um, he would hire me for the time he was shooting the film. And I asked if he was happy with my work, if he would take me to New York with him, which is what he did. And so there was a period of time where I was uh, uh, assistant editing on films that were shot in Texas and finished in New York. And mm -hmm. so that's how my editing career started uh, many, many, many years ago, uh, 40 three years ago to be exact. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's impressive. And you're, and you're, you're still in it. <laughs> you're still, still, you know, busy in the industry. Still rolling along, just uh, doing my best. That's right. And I have, our team did some research on you and it kind of says here that really your entry into TV directing was with the OC. Would you, would you say that that's accurate? Yes, I um, was editing pilots for Warner Brothers at the time and they wanted me to stay on various shows uh, to edit the series as well. Uh, the show um, uh, before the OC was a show called Fastlane, which was directed by McGee. And I did. I stayed on as an editor. And I didn't like editing in television because it's very, very hard work, a very thankless hard work. The editors, the editors in television are some of the hardest working people I know and some of the most underappreciated. And so I then was offered the pilot of the OC, and they asked me to stay on uh, to um, – um, edit on the series, and I, I didn't really want to do it. Uh, and so I, just as a bargaining point, I said, "Well, I will if you let me direct." And they, and they did. And so I, um, very happily, worked on the OC all four seasons. I edited the pilot, and then I started directing in the second season. And I was only directing in the fourth season. And I directed second unit on the series finale. I was with the show from the very, very beginning to the very, very end. Uh, it was a wonderful experience, and I, I owe a great deal to Stephanie Savage and to Josh Schwartz because they are really the ones that started my directing career. 
That's such a good segue. Well, first of all, I'm from the OC, so I, I love that. that. That was one of my favorite shows, which, but, which was which was never called the OC until the OC. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. I remember in middle school we used to say well, that, that famous saying. It's like, uh, "Welcome to the OC, bitch!" Like, and yeah. that was taken directly from the show. <laughs> yes, it was. Yeah, I feel like we were not cool until the show happened. Right, so, because, you, so you're telling me that you watched that show when you were in junior high? Yeah, in middle school. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you're really dating me now, Brian. <laughs> but, uh... All good. Um, but you know, it, so many of our uh, our listeners are you know members of our you know acting community, and I think what what is good for them to you know kind of hear is really how you know you started off you know editing, and then you kind of veered into a TV directing, and how. Really, it seems like because of the great work you did and the relationships you formed on that show, it basically led your uh, you know directing career to take off after that. Um, they might be interested in like in knowing how you did that, like how you made that happen, like how one opportunity spiraled into many, many more. Well, I directed a lot of episodes of The O.C. I directed six total. And then I continued to work with Josh Schwartz and Stephanie Savage on their two shows that they did right after that, which were Chuck and Gossip Girl. And so they hired me. I, I directed 12 episodes of Gossip Girl. I directed uh, uh, four episodes of uh, Chuck. Um, I think that um, um, and I edited the pilot on Chuck as well. Uh, so, you know, I, I as I said, I owe my directing career to to Josh Schwartz and, and Stephanie Savage. Uh, and from those shows, I started getting a lot of other work. I mean, I, I had an agent off of the OC, and so they started staffing me on other shows. Uh, for a long time, I was kind of very focused on the teen genre. I did a lot of shows for the CW and a lot of shows for ABC Family, which became Freeform. Um, I, but the the um, relationship I had with uh, Fake Empire Production Company that that was really what launched me into my directing career, and uh, I, I feel that I work hard, and I think that people like my work. If you look at my resume, I'm invited back very often to most of the shows I work on, so I'm I'm very I'm very happy about that, and, and feel very. Um, um, good about that as a, um, uh, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm, I, I find it gratifying that people invite me back. So, uh, Absolutely. yeah, so I, I uh, but I, I do feel that um, Josh and Stephanie really were the ones that uh, um, gave me a shot and supported me in the doing of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you, had, you, you mentioned that, you know, you kind of um, found a niche for yourself in the young adult genre and, you know, got called back to work on a lot of those shows. Um, I think a lot of our, you know, um, our, our actors listening to this, they, you know, they fear being like typecast or, you know, they have an equivalent, you know, as actors. Do you think like, was that something that you were concerned with that, you know, you seem to at first only, you know, get a lot of opportunities in the young adult genre? Or is that something that you feel like, you know, it's kind of like, Get work, break through, and then you can expand. No, I don't. I don't think I'm, I've never been one who thinks that way. I don't really think about work from a point of view of like, oh, this is good or bad. I'm delighted when people want to work with me, and I, I never have condescended to the material I work on. I feel like that the the teen genre is um, um, a wonderful place to to exist. I I um, feel that. Um, uh, I remember one time um, someone said to me, uh, everyone knows what it feels like to be a teenager. Everybody knows what that experience is. Uh, everybody can relate to a show like The O.C. or, or uh, 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 some of the other shows that I've worked on. Um, not everybody can relate to some of the, the more uh, sophisticated shows that uh, sometimes people say to me, you know, well, wouldn't you rather work on a show like this or that? And I'm kind of like, well, you know, I, I, I would welcome the opportunity to work on anything, but I enjoy watching a lot of shows that I don't necessarily want to work on. Uh, I, I feel like that the, I, I've been very fortunate. I've had a, I've had a very uh, uh, productive directing career. I've now directed over 130 hours of television. I, I, I don't remember what the last count was, but uh, uh, I have uh, in the, a very short period of time, really um, 
um, I feel like mastered that craft. And uh, as I did before, I mastered the editorial uh, craft and, and I welcome the opportunity to work. And so I, I've never been somebody who thinks about uh, uh, wanting to be somewhere else other than right where I am. Even when people ask me, what's your favorite show that you've worked on? I always say, well, the show that whatever I'm working on currently is my favorite because I really want to bring that beginner's mind to that process. I don't, I just, I've never been a person who really thinks about, you know, where I want to get to as much as I'm just trying to be very, very present with where I am. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, for sure. And I will just, and anyone who takes a look on your Instagram, it's like, you're also such a, you're such a, uh, you're somebody that a lot of people want to like get lunch with or want to, like, <laughs> <laughs> you have such a great energy. And I remember even when I was on set, you made me feel so comfortable. At one point you're like, you're like, Brian, I think you should go rest. <laughs> uh, well, that's, that's, that's so nice of you to say. I, um, social media is a very odd phenomenon and kind of, um, developed uh, alongside the, the experience I've had directing in terms of working on a lot of these um, shows that are aimed at younger audiences. And it was during that period of time that Twitter and Instagram were becoming popular. And, and I, I do have a large following on, um, on both, and I've been kind of mystified by that. But at the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm um, um, welcoming of the opportunity to share my life in whatever way it can be encouraging to others. And, and I do think that um, uh, it's, it's important to engage with the world. And I have a real uh, a tendency to kind of become reclusive. I mean, I would be perfectly happy just to curl up in my den with my books. But I do feel like that I work on these shows. And I, I do feel like that uh, many of the shows speak to people in ways that I I'm curious about, and, and social media has been a way for me to to really uh, engage with the the fans of whatever show I'm working on, and and to find out what's important to them. And it's really enriched my life. Uh, now, along with that, I think there there are certainly uh, negative uh, aspects to social media that I try to be careful of. Um, but for the most part, I find it to be a very positive experience, and I've had a very positive experience interacting with the people who like the work that I do. So have you had any negative uh, experiences personally, uh, you know, with, I don't know, your social media followers or is it? Uh, yeah, yeah, I have, I've had, I've had some, but, but not, um, not anything that I want to dwell on. You know, mm, I, okay. I just, there, there, there's always people who uh, will want to uh, bring you down. And oh. uh, my, my, uh, my philosophy is let the dogs bark. So right, 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 right. Uh, the, the, isn't there that, there that saying? Dogs only bark at parked cars, or, 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 or <laughs> well, there's you know, or something. There, 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 that was a failed metaphor attempt. <laughs> well, I I do feel like that um, uh, my my uh, desire is to uplift people, and I right. hope that I do that. And and uh, you know, the rest I, I can't do anything about. So I won't yeah, engage yeah. with the ugliness. Yeah. Yeah, no, the saying now is dogs don't bark at parked cars, meaning they only try to bring people down who are like really doing great stuff and, you know, like, you know, active, you know, kind, kind of, I think a lot of it stems from jealousy personally. You know? Well, I think that, that, you know, it's a business that invites a lot of different kinds of personalities. And, and I do think that um, uh, people get very impassioned about the things that they think are important. And, you know, I, I, I can't do anything about... Um, um, people who, 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 I, I'll just say, I, I, I just don't engage with the ugliness. That's all. Yeah. So yeah. that aspect of social media, I'm just like, okay, it exists. And right, I don't, right, I don't, right. I don't need to engage with it. That's, that's so cool though, that these like fans of the shows um, that you're working on follow you. Cause I don't think, I don't think that's like a trend for most uh, directors on the shows. Like most, I think fans of the shows would, you know, follow the actors or maybe follow the showrunner or the writer and, you know, maybe tweet that they don't like that a character died or something. But there must be something about your work that where resonates with them where they actually want to follow, follow you know, you who, who's the director on it, on the episode. Well, I, I mean, I can't, I can't speak to that. I don't know. But I, I feel that um, maybe it's because I engage with them. Maybe it is because I'm willing to to respond and to, to be engaged. I've had some, I've had some wonderful relationships grow out of, of, um, 
my relationship with strangers on the on the various shows that I work on, people who are fans of the show. And to the point that uh, even when I lost my spouse in uh, 2014, uh, a, a great number of people showed up at his memorial service uh, um, who I didn't even know, people that, that just had followed uh, both of us on social media. And I, I just was very moved by that. And I thought, okay, well, there's, you know, you, 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 um, you have an effect on people's lives that you, you don't even know about sometimes. And so my goal is just to always be coming from um, a place of the heart, I hope. Right, right. No, for, for sure. And, you know, I, I think, I actually think even our relationship, like, you know, after, you know, after, uh, you know, working with you, I think I followed you and we followed each other. And that's kind of how, how, um, how I, I was able to reconnect with you and get you to come teach at the studio. So uh, yeah, you kind of yeah. like I said, there's, there's a lot of really valuable things about social media and, and being, I mean, hell, I'm in touch with a whole lot of people I knew back in high school from Facebook. I mean, it's a wonderful thing. It's reconnected me with many, many people who've, who've meant a great deal in my life. And I'm, I'm very happy to, to be in touch with them. That being said, I also think it can be a time suck. And so I think it's very it's very important to kind of limit one's time on on that. And, and as I said, to to not engage with the ugliness, to to just leave the trolls alone and let the trolls be the trolls and, and they know who they are. Hey, it's Brian. I'm dropping in on an important announcement. What you need to know is you have more control over your career than you think. The thing standing between you and the career you want is your connections. And that's where one-on-one -on -one next level comes in. If you are not a member yet, you can apply to join at oneononenextlevel.com. Press pause and do that now. If you are already a member and you are ready to get back on track, we want to invite you to book a strategy session with us led by myself personally. We will help you prioritize which classes make the most sense given your career goals. You can find these under the resource hub in your account portal. We can't wait to hear your success story. Just because you brought it up, I wanted to see if you um, uh, wanted to talk about. I, I know your your late husband. You have a foundation for him, and that you know that that means a lot to you. Um, yes, I, I I I lost my spouse David in in 2014, and he was an artist, and so I did form a foundation in his name that um, is designed to support uh, artists. I've given out um, uh, 12 uh, grants and scholarships. Uh, my, my goal is to um, continue to do that as long as I'm able. And um, I think that, um, you know, again, how, how that manifests in the work of those various artists, I don't really know. All I know is that uh, I want to aid in their growth. And um, I, I am very happy to have done that. And it carries on uh, values that were important to David. So uh, thank you for asking about that and bringing that up. And uh, yeah, it's called the David Whaley Foundation. And anybody who's curious about it can check it out at davidwhaleyfoundation.org. So thank you. Of course, yeah. And I, you know, I, I also wanted to add that you know anybody who goes on your 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 personal blog can kind of see the some of the articles you've written about, and I find them to be such moving articles. Just about like they're so deep about about your perspectives on life and art. And um, I'm just wondering, like, how you like is that like a side passion of yours, or how did that how did that blog you know come to be? Well, I think that originally I was teaching at UCLA in the early aughts. And uh, I was uh, transitioning to a directing career. And so it became more than I could really do. I couldn't teach and direct at the same time. And a lot of people had asked me for copies of my lectures. And so I kind of transcribed some of them. And then, um, uh, I, I mean, I haven't written on that blog for a long time. But uh, it became a way for me to just uh, put some of my thoughts together in such a way that I could share them with people who were curious. And then when David died, it just became a way for me to kind of process my grief to write, write um, uh, about him in, in, in trying to um, 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 deal with the huge, devastating loss that that was for me. And um, I put it, I, I, I made them public because I wanted people to be able to um, access that if they could. I, I, I know many, many people suffer loss. My loss is not unique. And um, I do feel that uh, um, 
I, I think it's a good thing to remind people that uh, um, they're not alone in the experience of loss. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that you read some of that, Brian. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Or, or, you know, and I, I think when our team was doing the research, they were also, you know, really touched by, by your articles and how deep it was, you know, it, it made it onto, you know, our radar. And oh, that's nice. I, I do, you know, David was an, a remarkable person and, uh, I feel so fortunate to have, uh, had the years with him that I did. And, um, I think that, you know, as time has gone on, um, I, I, I feel like I'm in a very good place these days with, uh, the processing of, uh, that loss, but it will always be a wound. It will always be part of my, of my journey. And, uh, it brings, uh, enormous, um, depth to my life. I've actually thought about trying to write a book about grief, but not from the point of view of, um, you know, oh, woe is me, but more like the, the, the experience of grief can really open you to a deeper experience of life. And uh, the, the opportunity is there if one chooses to allow that process to happen. I think uh, a lot of people get very stuck in the experience of grief. They, they can't get beyond it. Um, I, 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 my own grieving process was very protracted, but I do believe that on the other side of that, there is a real depth of experience that can happen. I've actually been widowed twice. I had another uh, significant other. Uh, we weren't married at the time because we couldn't be, but we would have been if we could have been. And that, that was back in 1988. Wow. And, um, so I've lost two, uh, um, spouses, so to speak. Uh, I've lost two, and and uh, I will say that the loss of the first one uh, really deepened my experience of the relationship that I subsequently had. I never took it for granted, not a single day. There wasn't a single day where I was kind of like, oh, you know, this is this is boring. You know, I never felt that way. I felt I I, I was I was enriched by that relationship every single day of all of the years that we were together, and um, so I feel that you know, grief is a is a is an opening to a deeper experience. And I also think it's enhanced my work. I think that one of the reasons that um, uh, people enjoy working with me is because I am very present and I don't take the experience of, of directing uh, for granted. It's a privilege. It's a privilege to be able to work with people and to work with them in a, in a very um, vulnerable state, which what the process of acting is, a very vulnerable state. And to be able to to be someone who supports and guides uh, people in that experience. And I think that a lot of actors trust me. And I think that they trust me because they know that I genuinely care for them and that I'm genuinely present for them in that experience. And I would say that um, that ability has been uh, very much uh, enhanced by the experience of grief. I'm a better director having experience the losses I have. I'm a better uh, friend uh, to my friends. I'm a better um, uh, uh, citizen of the world in the sense that I know what it is to lose the most important thing and, and to know what that experience is. So to be able to bring oneself to uh, the experience of directing another human being in the expression of, of, of something, some artistic expression, is a real privilege for me and I don't take it for granted. And I think every actor that works with me would say that they know that. And I, yeah. I, I, I feel good about that. Yeah. I'm mean, definitely, any, you know, just all the, all the actors, I think even from like, uh, you know, like gossip girl, I just, uh, who keep in touch with you, you know, after yeah. all these years, I think it definitely makes a statement about that. Well, you know, it's hard to stay in touch with people, uh, but I do stay in touch with a lot of people. And I do find, I, again, one of the things that very deeply touched me when I lost my spouse was how many people turned out for me, how many people, uh, people that uh, I hadn't seen in years um, uh, really showed up for me and, and, and helped me through that process. But again, you know, the, the desire to act, the desire to perform, um, uh, the desire to really, as I said, be vulnerable in front of people uh, to, to capture a common experience that we can all share, um, that's, a, that's a wonderful thing. And I think that um, uh, 
I'm always very curious what draws people to acting and and what makes people want to be. I've never wanted to be an actor. I've always wanted to be on the other side of the camera. But but I do understand the um, the process very well, and I try to be very very supportive um, to people in that experience to feel the safest that they can feel, so that they can really go to the most authentic place. The problem I have with a lot of actors sometimes is that they're afraid to just let the authenticity be there and it becomes very performative. And so to try to make an actor feel safe enough so that they, they can let go of the performative part and just really be, that's the goal. And that's that's something that I really try to do and try to um, um, create a safe space so that actors can really go there as opposed to that place of, you know, being more self-conscious and, and worrying about what, what other people are seeing. Right, right. But you do have one acting credit to your name, apparently. I well, mean, that's that was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> that was a mistake. Yeah, I was in uh, I was working on a film in Morocco. I was editing a film in Morocco and they needed um, um, they, they didn't want to fly in another English speaking actor. And so they asked me if I would do a one line part. I was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> and it never occurred to me in a million years that they would put it in the credits, and they did. <laughs> and therefore, it's stuck there on my IMDb resume, and I can't get it off, and I've tried. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it looks like I had a miserably failed acting career <laughs> playing Israelite number one in uh, Solomon and Sheba, starring uh, Jimmy Smith and um, Halle Berry. I did have a scene with Halle Berry. You know, See, so they, that's that's much more than some people get to, right? <laughs> well, you know, it's just one of those things that uh, is 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 kind of humorous in retrospect, but you know, right, right. I, I did what I did, so yeah. it's there, it's there for the world to see. I'd love to talk about, you know, while we're on the subject of actors and acting, let's talk about two things. Uh, the first thing is, you know, um, if you can share some perspectives just from being on set so often of how some actors, you know, kind of common pitfalls, you know, they may make on set and how they can, I don't want to say stand out, but how they can make, you know, the producers, the directors, the writers, that the team want to, you know, bring them back and, you know, want to be able to work with them again and again, um, you know, as collaborators. Well, I think that I would say, first of all, the most important thing is that an actor know their lines and that they know their lines word perfect. I, I'm, I'm, I get very uh, uh, frustrated with actors who, who show up, who, who clearly have not um, um, really thoroughly learn their lines. I think that that's, that's, that's crucial for me. I think that because once, once an actor really knows their lines and knows them backwards and forwards and, and without fail, then they're free to play and they're free to, to, to um, uh, exist in the space without uh, self-consciousness because they're not worried about it. Now, I, I do understand that on a long running TV show um, that the, 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 the regular actors, the, um, the people who have uh, regular parts, it's a very hard occupation because sometimes I've worked with, uh, I mean, uh, I'm working on this show currently, Sweet Magnolias. The three actresses will sometimes, uh, the three lead actresses will sometimes have um, eight pages of dialogue to do in a day. That's that's very hard and that's something different. And I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about a day player that comes in and has um, a scene. They should know their lines word perfect. That should be just, that should just go without saying. Now, I like it when an actor makes a strong choice. I like it when an actor has an idea of what they uh, think is, is, is the way to approach a scene. But I um, feel uh, that once you're on set and once you're in a scene with another actor, you need to drop all that and just be in the scene. And I'm very aware when I'm working with an actor who has practiced the way they're gonna do it in front of the mirror, and they, they um, uh, don't deviate from that, uh, even when I give them a note. I've worked with those actors and I find, I find that to be uh, frustrating because I, I like that they've prepared, I like that they've thought about it, I've li I like that they've made a choice, but when, when you're on the set and something else is happening and you're working with other actors and you're in a space, that preparation work should be set aside and the only thing that should be happening is existing in that space with the other actor. And so one of my big notes to actors is I don't feel like you're listening 
you're, you're, you're in your own head. So listen to the other actor and respond off the other actor. So that's, that's definitely a note I have. Um, I, I think the other thing is I always try to get actors to, to slow down a little bit, which is counterintuitive. And I think a lot of directors in television particularly are, are telling actors to pick up the pace. Uh, I'm only worried, I'm only worried about the pace when I feel like it's, um, um, a, a one or, or people are moving through a scene or something. And then I, I will sometimes tell an actor, you know, this part of the scene needs to, you know, like you need to pick up your cue quickly. But what I really feel like is I want an actor to feel what they're saying. So I want them to be thinking about what they're saying. So I often am directing actors to slow down a little bit because particularly if I'm in coverage, I can, I can set the pace in the editing room. That's something I can do later, but I really want to make sure that the actor is feeling what they're saying and not, you know, not, um, uh, trying to rush through it. Yeah. And, and, and then I also think an actor should be aware of what their tell is. Every actor has a tell and every actor will, will um, fall back on that when they're trying to remember what they're going to say. So for instance, some actors will say, uh, and then they'll say the line, you know, and I think it's very yeah. important for an actor to know what that is and to make sure that they're, they're uh, conscious of it so that they can work against that. Uh, a lot of actors. A lot of actors will add a word before the line. They'll say "well," and then they'll say their line, and, and and that's so that they have a split second to remember what they're supposed to say next. And again, that comes back to the first thing I said, which is they don't know their lines well enough. If you right. know your lines, you're go, you're you're going to be able to hit the line hard. You don't need to add the extra word or the uh or the look or the whatever. Now, again, yeah. I totally understand how hard it is for actors who have eight pages of dialogue to learn in a day. But for the regular day player, that's not the case. So right. what I would say to most of um, the visiting um, actors on a show is like, know your words, uh, goddamn perfect, you know, right. and, 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 don't, and, 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 and don't add to it and don't uh, try to put it in your own words, learn the line as written. And then, and then we can go from there and we can start to play and we can start to experiment and, and find things. But um, it's really hard if you have an actor who doesn't know their lines. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's almost impossible. Yeah. And then the it's other thing I would say is that actors need to, be, you know, they just need to drop whatever their resistance is and just do what they're asked to do, you know, and, and just try it. Just try it. it. You know, I'm the first person, if something doesn't work, if I give a note and it doesn't work, I'm the first person to run in there and say, eh, that didn't work. I was wrong. You know, let's, let's, let's go back to uh, something different. But um, the last thing I want to do is argue about a note. You know, I don't want an actor to argue with me about a note. I just want them to try it. You know, do I don't, do I, I don't go in. Oh yeah, sure. Want? Yeah, um, sure. Yeah. I have lots of times where actors will start to argue with me and, and I, I you know, it's, it's, a, it's okay if they do, but it's a waste of time. And, right. and television is time management. You know, I always say to people, five minutes an hour is a full hour on a 12 hour day. So for every mm -hmm. five minutes that you save when you're shooting, you have a, a full extra hour of shooting at the end of a 12 hour day if you save five minutes an hour. And uh, I think that actors oftentimes don't know that. Actors oftentimes come in and kind of just wander around, you know, with a, without understanding that they are slowing things down. You know, so I come into a rehearsal very quick. I'm very like, you know, let's have you start here and go there. It's one of the reasons when I have taught uh, classes at your studio, I uh, like to teach blocking. I like to block the actors and scenes so that they understand what that process is. Because I've had a lot of actors show up and not really understand that they need to hit marks and that they need to, <laughs> that they need to be very flexible and that they need to be open to whatever is happening and they need to listen to the director. That's what the director's job is. That's who they should be listening to. And um, uh, I, I feel like that uh, when I get a lot of resistance, uh, well, I thought I'd do it this way. Well, that's fine, great. You thought you'd do it that way. I'm asking you to do it this way now. You know, right. I, I, don't, I don't give a note until I see what the actor is gonna do. I never give a note until after I, I've run a couple of takes and I kind of see what their preparation process has been and what mm -hmm. they're thinking about. And then I go in with a note. But if I go in with a note, I would like to see that note at least right. attempted, you know, I'm not coming in to just kind of have a conversation. I'm coming in because I'm not seeing something in the performance that I want mm -hmm. to see. And, mm -hmm. and um, 
um, you know, I try to keep my notes in a way that doesn't feel threatening. You know, I'm usually like, well, it occurs to me that maybe you might have this thought uh, before you say this line, or it occurs to me that maybe you make this movement here on this line as opposed to the line in front of it. You know, the, I, I, I try to make my notes um, sound like suggestions, mm -hmm. but quite frankly, what I'm really saying is I want to see it like this. Right. You know, right. And, and I think that the more an actor is really relaxed and willing just to like, yeah, sure, let me try that, as opposed to defensive and, and wanting to, you know, kind of um, um, lock into something that they practiced the night before, that's mm -hmm. frustrating. That's very frustrating right. when, yeah. uh, when, when that happens. And, and uh, so that's, those are things that I would say um, are, are some of the things that occurred to me. And you're a really actor friendly director. I know there are some directors who maybe they're more uncomfortable with working with actors and they just kind of want to do the technical stuff and kind of hide. But you like it's like you really understand like, you know, the actors like kind of like their journey, their preparation, kind of the, the, the jargon, so to speak. Well, I hope that's so. I mean, I certainly feel like that I come at it from a place of wanting, again, to make the actor feel safe, to make mm -hmm. the actor feel real. I've, I've had I've worked with actors who've had anxiety attacks while they're shooting. And wow. I and I am very, you know, compassionate to that. I've had I've had uh, uh, panic attacks in my own life. And so I know what that feels like. And so, you know, I, th there have been times where I've just stood off to the side of the camera and fed the actor their lines. And I'm perfectly willing to do that if that's, if that's something that's necessary. Um, but uh, that's, obviously that's not the ideal. But, you know, sometimes, you know, life, life happens. And, and I want an actor to feel safe. But in exchange for that, I want an actor to work with me. And I want an actor to do what I ask. And right. I don't ask things arbitrarily. I don't give a lot of notes. I'm not somebody who comes in and notes. I'm not somebody who comes in and goes, you know, here's this, 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 and this to do. I usually try to give them one note that I hope will cor correct the whole thing. Because I do find that if you're really clear about what the, what the scene is about, if you're clear about what the turning point is, and if you're clear about what the, what the purpose is, what the actor wants, then it's very easy to give a note and say, you know, your goal is this. So perhaps maybe uh, you try this line with a, uh, beseeching the other person a little bit more or whatever it is. I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just trying to make something up here. But I, I do think that the worst thing in the world is when I just feel somebody dig their feet in and just right. go, well I, well, I don't see it that way. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I've had actors, you know, tell me, well, you know, uh, why would I do that? And I'm like, well, because it says so right here in the script. It oh says do God. this, you know, and I've had actors really uh, uh, start to, to, to argue about that. That has not been my general experience. My general experience, I would say 80% of the time is lovely. Lovely. You know, like most actors are great, you know, 80% of the time, but there are the 20%. And maybe that's who I'm kind of making the, the, the pitch to, the 20% that feel like they know better, you know, I just, I feel like just open your mind to the fact that maybe you don't know, and I don't know, that we discover that together, you know, right. as opposed to coming into the situation feeling like you already know, you know, yeah. like be, be, be open to um, experimentation, be open to something else happening, be open to the fact that the other actor is now giving you something that you haven't had in your preparation. And so you it's it's a whole new ball game at that point. And be open to the fact that the director's job is to watch. It's not the actor's job. It's not the actor's job to watch themselves. It's the director's job to watch them. Absolutely. The actor's job is to be present in the other scene. I've had I've had actors who who will call cut in the middle of a take, who will go like, oh, I need to stop it, you know, I need to call cut. And I'm like, that's not your job. That's not your job to call cut. That's not your job. You get lost in a scene, then you know the director will probably call a cut if you're if you're irretrievably lost. But I, I've had one one actor who who um, um, uh, continually called cut. Oh and my god! I, and I, I finally had to, to have a conversation with this actor and just say, "You cannot do that. That's not your job. Your job is not." And and that actor was kind of like, "Well, I, I didn't want to go. I didn't want." you to use any of that. And I said, again, it's not your job, you know, and it's like, your job is not to be watching yourself. If you're watching yourself, then you're not in the scene. 
if right, you're exactly. if you're outside of yourself watching yourself if you're observing the performance and judging the performance then you're not in the scene you're not acting with the other person you're not mm-hmm. giving the other actor what they need you're 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 self-conscious and i and i i really try to get actors uh to let go of their self-consciousness let me be the one that's judging let me be the, the one that's watching for what it is i need your job is to show up and be in the scene with the other person without um, an awareness of the camera. And um, if, if you're calling cut, it's because you're judging it. You're judging right. it as, as something. Um, is this something and, and, you've noticed more of recently, like a re- more recent trend where this happens? Or would you say over the last you know 20 years that you've directed, um, kind of the, it's been a similar like, you know? No, it, I mean, it happens with some, some people, you know, I mean, some actors are just watching themselves. They're outside of themselves so watching themselves. It's 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 always been but you know my job is to do that not not their job these are these are great uh great tips i wanted to uh, like see if there's ever been an instance where like maybe there was an actor booked for a few episodes originally but you know maybe that you and the the writing team and the the showrunner just liked him or her so much that you know that they kind of were asked back over and over again and, and kind of just became a you know part of the regular crew like is that oh sure that yeah. Ever happened? yeah yeah um uh, Zuzana, um, who played uh, Dorota on Gossip Girl, she was just she came in for you know um, to read for a one line part, and uh, you know they used her again for another line here and there. And then there was an episode of Gossip Girl where there was a big storyline that had um, Leighton Meester's mother, who was played by Margaret Collin, um, was carrying several scenes and she wasn't available for the episode we needed. And so the decision was made that they would give those, those lines to, um, Zuzana who played, uh, Dorota. And, uh, I, um, I was, wor- I was directing that episode and I said, well, if you're going to give, if you're going to give her those lines, let's, let's ma- let maybe there's some, I, I asked the writers if, if there was some way to, to, to just shape the part a little bit more so that it, gave the character a little bit more dimension that you know she'd been with the family for years and years so that she so that made sense that she was kind of talking to the character in this mother role and uh, then that um uh, became kind of an ongoing thing throughout the rest of the series and i think they even did a web series based around dorota but she was hired for basically a one-line part you know i'm so curious like what makes like what makes an what is so special about like you know an actor that makes you know the writing team and you know the director want to kind of mold the role around them or like well, even expand I, I, the original role? I don't know that I can really speak to that because I wasn't uh, you know on any level involved in the writing of that show, but I can say that Susanna was like um, a joy to work with and uh, and 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 very very um, flexible and willing to you know just take any note. I don't, I don't know what to say to that. I, I, I think that, uh, you know, um, the, the writers, uh, they're the ones who determine, you know, what's, what's, um, um, going to happen, um, with any character. Um, I, so I can't really speak to that. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But as long as, you know, they're good, they're good to work with on set, you know, it gets the stamp of approval from you. <laughs> yes. No, I, 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 I love to see it when it happens. I love to see, you know, characters come back. There's a lot of characters that we have on Sweet Magnolias who are, um, you know, characters that showed up one time and then the right, the, the showrunner, she writes them back into the show. And, and uh, it's always great when you see somebody become a semi-regular, you know. Right, right. Absolutely. Um, the second part of kind of this, this acting actor discussion is, and I think um, oftentimes you're involved in the audition process. Oh, yeah. Um, mm. And I wanted to see if you can share any tips for actors, you know, in the audition process, especially when they get to kind of, you know, you or past casting, you know, kind of in that callback process for, you know, how they can stand out, how they can, I don't want to say how they can book the part, but any tips on how they can get further along in the process and any any, I don't know, anything in particular that when you see it, it's kind of a red flag and makes you go, mm, not, not that person. Let's, let, let's look at other choices. Well, I'll speak to the first part of the question. Um, the, the thing that I always like to say to actors 
is remember that you're a human being interacting with other human beings. This isn't, you know, um, some type of situation where you are walking in front of automatons. And I always appreciate it when an actor is very uh, present to the fact that there are people in the room with them. You know, it's not a judge and jury. It's, it, yes, a lot of actors want to... Um, um, book the part and that seems to be the goal but really the goal should be you just have a chance to perform if you love to act you have a chance to perform and so i always uh, just encourage actors to relax and realize that with each person that walks through the door those people in that room want you to succeed we're not looking for people to fail. We're looking for someone to succeed. And if you are reaching the level of callbacks, you have already succeeded by the fact that you're there. You know, so I always uh, try to get actors to uh, relax, relax. It's a group of people who want you to succeed. So walk into the room with a certain level of appreciation and confidence. And I can't tell you the number of times in the directing of over 130 episodes at this point, that we haven't picked a person for one scene perhaps, but then we'll like them and then we'll bring them back for something else. And sometimes we'll bring them back several times before we find a part for them. But just because you don't book that particular part doesn't, it's not a judgment on you. It's not personal. You know, sometimes it's the height of somebody, you know, it's kind of like, oh, they're too tall for the person they're, in the scene against, and it's going to be too hard to get two heads that are of such differential into the frame together. Oh, we need a blonde instead of a brunette because we just have too many brunettes. Uh, oh, we need uh, somebody who is um, um, fits this definition of the character a little bit more. It's it's there's a thousand things, and you know, like I always want to follow actors out of the room and go like, "That's a great audition," and it's not personal that we're not choosing you. You right. know, it's like, it's yeah. not personal. It has nothing to do with anything that you did in the audition that you could have done better, or maybe you didn't do it very good. I mean, there's plenty of times when, when and, and also there's a, a group of people who are choosing. I mean, I just came off of a show where I had different choices than the producers did, you know? So, so there are oftentimes, you know, you, you basically, as far as I'm concerned, you won the audition for me, but the producers wanted somebody else. And, and, and I'm a visiting director. And so, you know, I don't get to choose that. Or oftentimes, you know, on my show, Sweet Magnolias, uh, there are four of us who weigh in on uh, all of the various parts and all of the various uh, auditions. Um, and five, if you include visiting directors, but I'm talking about the, when I direct, you know, um, there's four of us. And then when, when there's a, another director on an episode, then there's five of us. And, um, within that, you know, we will have debates about, well, this person versus that person or, or, you know, um, uh, it, it sometimes comes down to just like, well, it's three against two or it's, uh, three against uh, one, you know, it's just, there, there, there's, there's debates about these things. But I, I just, I would, I would say to any actor walking into a room in a callback, particularly, if you're called back, that means they liked you, you know? <laughs> that means that you were, you were liked, you did a good job. And, and, and when you come in again, then I would say to you, a lot of times the reason we do callbacks is to see if somebody can take a note. I oftentimes give a note in a callback it's not anything I'm like the performance could be perfect, but I want to see, can they take a note? So I'll just give a note. I'll just say in a callback, let's try it like this just to see if they can do something different because if they can not take a note, then, then, um, that's not going to work. Yeah, yeah. That's a red flag. So, um, I, I, uh, oftentimes will give a note just to see, um, and, and, you know, and it'll be confusing because then the actor will come on set and think that that's the performance I want. And I go, no, no, I liked your original performance. I just wanted to see if you could take a note. Right. So it's, you know, there's a lot of times. I don't like casting off a tape. I hate when I have to choose somebody off of a tape because I feel like until I'm in the room with somebody, until I actually know if I have um, 
uh, a chemistry with them, it's 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 very difficult to right. pick, pick right. somebody just off the tape. I hate I hate picking actors off a of tape, but um, you know it's, that seems to be more and more the the, the norm. norm. Yeah. yeah, and I think I think that's unfortunate because I think there's a lot to be gained by just having a conversation with an actor and seeing if you have chemistry with them. Absolutely. Any any other red flags that you think you know uh, actors should avoid, especially in the callback process? Don't deviate from the script you know don't deviate from the script i've seen actors come into auditions and they're not even close to the lines you know and uh i I, they just add a bunch of words i i call it embroidering i i I, and i'm always nervous about it if i see an actor who comes in and is kind of like adding all these uh well you know uh, I just, uh, you know, I like, uh, it's like, uh, <laughs> whenever anybody is that, I call it embroidering. I'm like, uh, uh-uh, that person embroiders too much. And, um, you know, I, I'm looking for people who are crisp and clean and have a, a clear thought process. I'm not looking for somebody who's going to rewrite the script. And so right. I would say, if you're coming into an audition, it's always best if you're, you know, and I'd much rather an actor, if an actor is not off book, then that's fine with me. I'd rather them just hold the sides and read the line. You know, I'm not yeah. looking for, I'm not looking for a finished performance. I'm looking to see if the person has a clear sense of precision, how to read a line. Is it read with some sense of feeling? Do they have a thought process behind it? Have they made a clear and intelligent choice? Those mm-hmm. are the things I'm looking for. But when somebody right. comes in and is attitudinalizing and trying to add a bunch of stuff to what's written, I, I think it's a red flag. And right. I, I think that the, the, the closer one can be to the script, the better. If one feels the need to use the sides, I don't have any problem with that. I know some directors do, but I don't. I don't have any problem with, a, with an actor using sides. Hey folks, Brian here. Mark and I often cringe when people call one-on-one next level a workshop studio because we are so much more than that. You and I both know that not all workshop studios are the same. And I can tell you with complete confidence that no other studio offers the same level of care or programming that we do. And we do so with pride. Here's just a few examples. I'm Emily. And before one-on-one next level, I was in a super dark place in my career. I tried a lot of things to find representation, but nothing seemed to work and I felt invisible. Then almost as a Hail Mary, I signed up for a manager session. It was incredible, but it was also the thing to land me a manager. Since then, I booked a national commercial. I've gone on to create a thriving voiceover career and signed with an agent all through these classes and programs. One on One Next Level has been the single most important thing that's influenced my acting career and life in so many ways. I'm Neil. In the last year, I booked two co-stars and one top-of-show guest star on major TV series. I also shot my first lead in a feature film. In fact, I've hit 20 big milestones thanks to the connections that I've made in classes at One on One Next Level. The key has been getting in front of casting directors. And that's why I love One on One Next Level. If you're not a member yet, what are you waiting for? Every actor deserves face time with the people in the business who can move your career forward. And One on One Next Level can help you do that. Did you know One-on-One Next Level produces over 335 events and classes each month? Whether you join us in person or attend on Zoom, you can meet with A-list casting directors, filmmakers, TV showrunners, and executive producers, as well as agents and managers when you become a member. These days, it's harder and harder to get real face time with industry pros, but One-on-One Next Level makes it possible. To become a member, visit www.oneononenextlevel.com and click join. We can't wait to hear your success story. Something you've mentioned in your classes, I know that I find I, I love the story is um, when an actor books a job, you sometimes fi- you find it interesting that they'll show up to set and they'll like introduce themselves to you and you'll say, I know I, I was there for the callback. We've already met. Well, that's what I mean about n- knowing that you're walking into a room of other human beings, you know, because I feel like a lot of times people are so nervous going into an audition that they don't even register on who's in the room with them. So right. I, I have I have great respect for those actors who will come in and say, uh, so you're the director, nice to meet you. So you're the producer, nice to meet you. you. Somebody who really takes the time to register on who's in the room, as opposed to those guys who come in and only focus on the casting director and are completely nervous and completely uh, you know, oblivious to the other people that are in the room with them. Because I, I find that that those people 
will be oblivious on the set as well. And I feel like that the most important thing in this process is to realize that you're dealing with other human beings. And so register on other human beings. Register on the fact that, oh, this person is the director. This person is the writer. This person is the casting director. Got it. I know who I'm, I know who I'm speaking to. And, and to, to, to be really engaged with them as people as opposed to uh, just some type of, as I said, some judge and jury that they don't even look at. You know, and I've had people walk in and do a reading for me where they never make eye contact with me the entire time they're in the room. And I'm always like mystified by that because I just feel like I'm, I'm the easiest person in the world to talk to. You, you know, are, it's, yeah. it's, it's just to me, you know, if, if, if somebody's not making eye contact with me, then I just feel like, all right, well, they're not engaged. And yeah. um, so that's another red flag, I guess. I, I just I want to I want to make sure that actors feel comfortable. That's really right. what I what I uh want to stress more than anything else. My goal is to make an actor feel comfortable because I do realize it's hard work and I do realize that it's, it's work that needs a certain amount of, um, of, um, um, support. You need to support the, 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 you know, the, the people that are, that are performing in front of you. And so, you know, I want the actor to open themselves to that support. Now, that being said, the other thing that I think is a red flag is when an actor comes in and just won't stop talking you know, like starts, you know, telling us all about their day, telling us about every errand they ran before they got to the audition, you know, or, um, um, you know, I, I, I always find that to be a little um, bizarre, too, when, when right, they don't, right. you know, it's, it's a fine it's a, line. It's yes, a it is a fine line. It's a fine line to exist in the space with other human beings without suddenly turning it into party chatter, you know, right. and um, I think that, uh, you know, I would I would want uh, actors to be respectful of the fact that there's, you know, maybe sometimes 10 other people waiting to be seen, you know, so to like come in, do your thing. Um, if I want, uh, if I want to give a note, if I want to see something else, I'll ask for it. You, you know, you don't need to offer that up. I, I know that I can ask you to do it a different way, you know, so um, uh, I don't mind a question. If an actor has a question before they read, that's fine. I think that's a that just shows some sense of uh, consideration. They want to make sure that they're on the same page as you. So if they ask a question about, you know, how to play a scene, I think that's, that's perfectly wonderful. Um, um, I, I just, you know, I, I want them to be relaxed. I want them to come in and make a clear choice and, and then show us what they got and then be detached about what the result is because right. The results will be whatever it is, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, these are these are great tips, and uh, straight from the, the horse's mouth. So, <laughs> thank you for them. I, um, you know, this podcast is part of our studio's thirtieth anniversary celebration, and we've really, throughout, you know, each one of our uh, podcast uh, interviews, wanted to ask about stories of perseverance, um, and I wanted to see if there's ever been. Um, you know, like a, a time in your life where you feel like you took a risky decision and, you know, that, you know, at the time maybe seemed like a bad move, but, you know, it really, you know, it, it paid off against all the odds or if there was a time where, you know, you felt like, you know, so many of our listeners are actors, you know, it's, it's kind of maybe a daily thing where you question whether you should quit or not or, or find another uh, a journey. Like, are there stories of perseverance on your end where you thought you were going to, you know, hang the towel on directing oh, yeah. or editing, sure. but, mm -hmm. but you've pushed through? Yes, um, there was a period of time in the early 90s when uh, I, um, I had uh, been an assistant for a while and I was starting to edit. I had one, I think one or two editing credits to my name, but then I couldn't find work. I couldn't find work as an assistant because uh, people thought I was overqualified to be an assistant and I couldn't find work as an editor because they thought I didn't have enough credits to be an editor. And so there was a, there was a good, I want to say it was maybe even a two year period where I just literally could not find a job. Wow. And, um, I, uh, started temping. I started, um, uh, temping at various offices in Los Angeles. I temped at an agent's office. I, I was, uh, I filled in for an assistant to a couple of literary agents for a couple of weeks. And, they came out to talk to me at the desk when on my last day, they, they said, uh, they said, we want to know your story. You're no temp, you know? <laughs> and, uh, they said, we think you're really good. And we want you to go into our junior agent program. And I was like, nah, that's not for me, but thanks a lot. You know? And I told him, I said, look, I said, I just, I, I basically want to, um, 
uh, edit, but I can't find any editing work, you know. And so that went on for many months, and I, I attempted law offices. I had a, I had a, um, a personal injury attorney who kind of kept me employed for a long time, who became a good friend of mine. Uh, I, I was really um, um, considering all kinds of alternative careers and, and, and maybe leaving Los Angeles. And I was eating a lot of peanut butter sandwiches. And then I, I got a call out of the blue from this guy. And he um, said, I want you to meet Don Coscarelli, who had directed the, the movie Phantasm. And they were, they were doing Phantasm 3. And um, Don was uh, interviewing... Um, uh, editors. And so I went to meet with him and I was driving over there and I thought, Oh shit, what am I going to say when he asked me, what have I been doing for the last several months? Because I haven't done anything since, since I, I don't even remember how long the time period was, but I thought, I'm just going to be honest. I'm just going to be honest about it. And so uh, I went in and sat down and sure enough, he, he looked at my resume and he said, well, I see that there's this big gap on your resume. You haven't done anything in a while. And why? And I told him, I said, well, I said, to be perfectly honest, uh, you know, I've been temping and I, I, I've been doing this. And I said, look, there's lots of people who can edit your movie. And um, I said, there's lots of people who can edit it as well as I can or maybe even better. But at the end of the day, it boils down to who you want to sit next to for 10 hours while you're <laughs> while you're while you're doing this. And I said, I can do a good job. And I said, I'd really love to do it. And um he liked that. He liked that answer. He liked the fact that I was direct. He liked the fact that I was honest. He liked the fact that I, that I wasn't ashamed about the fact that I hadn't been working. And um, uh, he hired me. And then wow. off of that job, I've never been unemployed since. And uh, that was, I think, I, it was, I can't remember the year, uh, but it was, well, whenever Phantasm 3 came out. Um, but uh, I um, uh, am very grateful to Don. He's still a good friend. I Loved working on Phantasm 3 with him. It was one of the most joyful uh, editing experiences I had. And um, uh, I just um, uh, really recommend being very honest about one's um, current yeah. situation. I, I just think that, you know, people are genuinely good for the most part. I think there's, you look, there's lots of bad eggs and there's lots of people in Hollywood who are assholes. But for the most part, my experience has been that people want to help. People want to, to, to offer up their support to uh, other people. And um, I, I really believe that if, if, if you go at the business from that point of view of understanding that, yeah, there'll be plenty of assholes out there. And like I said earlier, let the dogs bark. That's just the way it is. But if you can be genuinely expectant of people's best, that that's, that's the experience that will meet you. I really do believe that. I believe that um, people will try to help you. People will try to, to, to kind of offer support. And, uh, you know, my experience of, of, of uh, working in Hollywood for the last 40 years uh, it really bears that out. You know, my experience has been 80% really positive, maybe even 90. Yeah, there's the 10% or the 20% that's that's kind of like, that was kind of an right. iffy situation. But yeah. overall, my experience is, has been really, really positive. My experience of producers has been positive. My experience of writers has been positive. My experience of actors has been positive. I've been extremely lucky to work with wonderful people who really want to support those around them. If you right. come at it with that expectation, then I do believe that people will, will, will meet you there. If you That's come great, at it, yeah. if you come at it from the point of view that, that uh, people want to um, hurt you, tear you down, uh, judge you uh, or, or hateful to you, then that is the experience that you will meet. That is so true. I feel like, especially the latter, sometimes it can be a defense mechanism, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But certainly a lot of people have that mindset and it really reads. And I think that's why, you know, at least from my personal experience working with you, it's such a, you know, breath of fresh air. Oh, well, that's nice, Brian. I really appreciate that. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, um, kind of in your, uh, in your periods of grief, how you were able to pick yourself back up and 
um, you know, uh, get back to to your career and and to your work. Because um, I know a lot of a lot of artists in general. Um, sometimes it's a struggle with whatever's going on personally, and they find that that kind of uh, hinders their ability to carry on with their art. Um, just wondering if you wanted to maybe share some some insight on that. Well, I. I was very lucky that uh, when uh, David died, I was surrounded by a lot of people at that particular point in time who kept me employed. One of the shows being Rizzoli Niles, as you talked about, uh, the people on Pretty Little Liars, the people on Rizzoli Niles, the people on The Fosters, um, uh, the, 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 these people kept me employed. And so in uh, 2015, I think I directed 15 episodes of television in that following wow. year. I don't remember a lot of that period of time because I was working so much. Um, also, there was a show, The Mysteries of Laura, that I did uh, four episodes of. Um, was it four episodes or three episodes? I can't remember. It was either three or four. I know I was in New York. I think it was on The Street of Laura, or maybe I'm making it I, up. I, I uh, uh, was on it a lot over that period of, uh, that, that, uh, period of 2015, 2014 into 2015, I was really wonderfully supported by uh, the crews and the cast. And um, uh, I uh, owe a great debt of gratitude to all of the people during that period of time because uh, I really was surrounded by a lot of love. I really was. I, I was surrounded by a lot of love and a lot of just genuine care from people because people knew what I'd been through and knew just how devastated I was. I think that, uh, again, as I said earlier, that experience of, of love really allowed me to be present with those people in such a way that I think it made me a better director. You know, I think that just coming at um, the experience, really understanding that these people love me and I love these people, you know, that the actors that I've worked with during that period of time, I love them. You know, it's not it's not like, oh, I like them. No, no, I love them. They're they're genuinely good people who who helped me. Some of the writers during that period of time, genuinely good people who who really wrapped their arms around me and took care of me. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm trying to think of all the shows I did during that period of time. Uh, Switched at birth. Um, 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 I. I uh, Stitchers. I look back on that year following uh, uh, David's death, and I, I just feel like God. I was really genuinely supported by so many people, uh, and that made me just feel that okay, well, um, that it's a great gift to work in this business and to work with people and to really open yourself that deeply to people to really allow people to help you on that level. Um, uh, and to try to then offer that back as best you can. So I think that really was the thing that got me through that, that initial period of time. Uh, as I said, my, my grief was really protracted. I, I felt very sad for a long time. Uh, I still feel sad. I mean, like I said, it's a wound that will never go away. But um, I do feel that I uh, credit uh, my colleagues for lifting me up during that period of time. I credit my agents, I credit my manager, I credit those people who really surrounded me with a certain um, experience of support and love. Uh, and and that, um, that made all the difference. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't done it yet, grab the Backstage Pass. Don't treat this podcast as mere background entertainment. The Backstage Pass offers exclusive resources and behind-the-scenes footage that empower you to make a real impact on your career.